Good morning. Thank you all for coming out today. What a day. We needed this, a little bit of a break from the usual that we've been doing. I think you all can appreciate that. You know it's been a bizarre summer when this is the first time I've been on the water all summer. First time I'm on the boat, which is saying something for me. Uh, we have a lot of great friends here today, and it's a good day. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging Commissioner Basil Sagos, who's doing a great job. We have Kelly Cummings, who is the Director of Operations, who just makes things happen, and that's so important, especially now. We have our great Nassau County Executive, Laura Curran, sporting her Islanders mask. Go Islanders! What a game last night. We're going to do it. We are going to do it. I believe it. That's the New York spirit. Uh, let's thank uh, Captain Nick Dionisio and the Atlantic Pearl for hosting us today. Thank you very much, Captain. We have my colleagues from Albany. We have Senator John Brooks, Senator Gorin, Senator Kaminsky, Senator Kaplan, Senator Martinez, and Senator Thomas, and Assemblyman Steve Engelbright. Thank you all very much for being out today. Let me talk about, uh, even in this setting, uh, we're still dealing with COVID, obviously. Today is day 200 that we've been dealing with COVID since it started. We are the most advanced state in the nation in terms of doing testing. Uh, people talk about COVID, how are we doing? In New York, we know how we're doing because we have data. We have more numbers than any state, more numbers than any nation on the globe pro rata. Yesterday, we did about 75,000 tests statewide. To give you an idea of what 75,000 tests means, when we first started COVID, we had the capacity to do 500 tests per day, 500. We're now up to 75,000 tests. Uh, no one had ever talked about testing like this before. And many of the other states are still struggling because, frankly, they haven't been able to come up to speed the way we have. But 75,000 tests, statewide, the infection rate was 0.87%, which is uh, very good. We had four New Yorkers who we lost yesterday from COVID. 483 who were hospitalized, which is just about where it was, 138 people in ICU, which is actually down a couple, which is good news. Uh, Long Island, the infection rate was 1.3% yesterday. Our calibration now between managing COVID and opening businesses, right? That's an ongoing tension. Uh, we're opening businesses all across the state. We have precautions. We have regulations on opening businesses. But every business wants to be open. Uh, movie theaters want to open. Concert theaters want to open. New Yorkers want to get back to life, uh, normal life. Yes, I understand. But we're not yet at a point where we can get back to normal life. That is just the fact. They talk about the new normal. We still have to manage COVID. Well, it's not a crisis the way it was. It's not a crisis the way it was because we managed it. Had we not done what we are doing, it would have been a crisis. You look at these other states where you see the infection rate going through the roof. What's the difference between those states and New York? The virus is the same. It's just that we are managing it, and we are informed, and we're taking the tests, and we're disciplined. What is the calibration between opening businesses and managing COVID? It's actually as simple as math. It's a mathematical equation. We don't want to see the COVID infection rate go over 1% for any period of time. So 
calibrate the economic activity, open as much economic activity as you can to go up to that 1% infection rate. 1% means one person is actually infecting one other person. That is a rate of spread that you can manage. That's what 1% means. So keep opening up economic activity to get right up to that 1%, okay? You want to drive from here to Pennsylvania as fast as you can. Fine. The speed limit is 55 miles an hour. Do 55 miles an hour all the way. Do 55.9 miles an hour. That's the fastest you can go. The fastest we can go is 1%. Yesterday, we were over 1% statewide. First time in about 40 days, but we were over 1%. Today, 0.87. Some days we're at 0.9. So we are right up at that limit of 1%. Why don't you open more movie theaters, open more concerts? You're at 1%. Why don't you increase restaurant percentages? You're at 1%. It's not like we have a margin of error here, my friends. We are right up against it. Uh, and that's the smart calibration on managing COVID. So do as much economic activity as you can without going back into an outbreak crisis. And by the way, if you're going back into an outbreak crisis, you know what you do then? You have to close down the economic activity that you opened. That's what happened in all these other states. We're going to increase economic activity right away. Let's get back to normal. Bang! The infection rate went right back up. They had to close everything back down. That is the last thing we want to do. But when people say, you know, we want to get back to normal, we want to do more, we are doing as much as we can and still managing the infection rate. And you'll see it on a day-to-day -day basis. Yesterday being over 1%, I didn't sleep last night. You do not want to be over that 1% for any prolonged period of time. Uh, and that's why today being back at 0.87 is actually good news for us. Another point about COVID. COVID was a trauma for this country. COVID was like being at war. Uh, I don't know that we've even fully appreciated all the effects of the trauma that we've gone through. There's going to be PTSD from COVID. Uh, this was frightening. This was a science fiction movie come to life, right? And you have seen people struggling with it. People struggle with it psychologically. Next week, we're going to be talking about the mental health consequences of COVID. We are so much in the middle of it right now. We're dealing with it every day, every day, every day. We haven't really taken a moment to step back. But you tell me what the effect on school children is going to wind up being. Uh, you tell me the effect of the increase in domestic violence, the increase in substance abuse that we know has been going on. So COVID, yes, deal with it today, but this is a profound, transformational moment in society. And there are a lot of lessons from COVID. One of the lessons to me about COVID is it shows you how dangerous denial is. Well, COVID, who would have known? Anyone who was paying attention would have known. That's who would have known. We had the SARS outbreak in 2002, a coronavirus from China 
that came from a wet market. That was 2002 SARS. We had Ebola. We had Zika. We had H1N1. We had dengue. We had MERS in 2012, a coronavirus that came from China. What did we do? Nothing. Nothing. And then we have COVID. It's not that it came out of the blue. It's that we denied all the warning signs. Why? Because to make the kinds of changes we had to make were hard. We knew that the World Health Organization had missed MERS and had missed SARS. We knew the CDC was not ready for this. We knew we needed a public health emergency response that we didn't have in this country. But warning, 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 and then COVID happens, and now it's undeniable. That is a dangerous pattern in life. You know where else you see that pattern? You see, you see it with climate change. How many warnings have we had? How many times do there have to be wildfires in California? How many times hurricanes? How many scientists have to sign a letter? How many superstorms? How many times do you need to hear the projections that the global temperature is rising and sea levels are rising? How many warnings have we had? And if we don't act, the same lesson from COVID is we'll see a calamity. And then it's going to be a calamity that is going to be transformative and disruptive and do economic damage and possibly cost human lives. It is the same pattern. Warning, 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 and you do nothing. If you had a chest pain, chest pain, chest pain, you don't go to the doctor. Don't be surprised when you have a heart attack. The lessons of COVID, the lessons of climate change to me, the pattern is very similar. We've learned from COVID. New York is going to learn from COVID. You don't have to tell us twice. Uh, we are going to be the model of public health response in New York State. We were reliant on the federal government. They were supposed to be in charge of global pandemics. CDC, NIH, Department of Homeland Security, they were supposed to be the international monitors. Shame on them. We now know what we have to do to manage a public health emergency, and we're going to do it in New York. We also know what we have to do to get in front of climate change before there's another wake-up call that may be a heart attack. And we're going to do the same thing. We are already the nation's leader when it comes to climate change and the environment, and we're going to even increase that. And I'm going to speak to it next week, and the DEC commissioner and our team is working on it. We have to recover from COVID. We have economic damage. Fine. Let government stimulate the economy, and let us do the long-term projects that we need to do, like in renewable energy. Uh, that's, that's going to be the silver lining here when they write the history books, if we do it right. Uh, today, we are uh, going to do something that we've been talking about that is long overdue, that is common sense, which is uh, in build artificial reefs. The artificial reefs help Long Island so many different ways. They help with shoreline erosion. Uh, they help with the ecology. They help with fisheries. They stimulate tourism. Uh, fishing is not just a great hobby. It's also a great economic development tool. Tourism is a great economic development tool. And these artificial reefs, uh, our children will thank us for them years from now. Uh, the divers and the people who fish in the fishing industry will thank us next year. These reefs start to develop a fishery 
literally in months. Uh, it's amazing how they stimulate a whole ecosystem unto themselves. Uh, to do this was hard. Everything is hard, right? There's nothing that is really worth doing of this scale that's easy. But DEC, God bless them, Nassau County, thank you very much, our legislators who gave us the authorization. Uh, I want to thank Wells Fargo. We're going to be dropping 70 rail cars uh, into the reefs as structure on the bottom. You're also, we're also going to be uh, doing vessels, a tugboat, turbines, etc. cetera, a, an array of equipment, array of material that makes diving interesting. Uh, it will be, it's all been cleaned, it's environmentally sensitive, but it's going to create the reefs. Wells Fargo is donated rail cars to the DEC, and I want to thank the DEC for having the creativity to do it. These are rail cars. You learn a lot of trivia as governor. At one time, they used to use subway cars uh, for reef material. Subway cars, commuter rail cars, Long Island Railroad, are now made out of aluminum, and the aluminum doesn't uh, last, and it can actually be destroyed by the current. So these are rail cars that carry lumber, heavy material, they're all heavy steel. They'll be here uh, long after we all are gone. Uh, this is the Hempstead Reef. We'll be out about three miles, but this is another installation in what we're doing with the 12 reefs uh, all around Long Island and in the Long Island Sound. Uh, I like it because it shows while we're dealing with COVID, there are other things we have to do at the same time. Just because we have to deal with COVID doesn't mean everything stops. Uh, and it says, yes, there are things that are hard and complicated and difficult, but we can still do them. And this is a time when everything we're doing is hard and complicated and difficult. Opening schools is hard and complicated and difficult. Fighting COVID is hard and complicated. Regulating the economy is hard and complicated. But we are New York and we thrive on hard and complicated. Uh, New York is a community of people who took on a tough place and a tough community, and they rose to the occasion. We did it during COVID. No community rose to the occasion like New Yorkers rose to the occasion. We went from the highest infection rate in the nation to the lowest infection rate in the nation. That's what the history books are going to say. That happened for one reason, because New Yorkers stepped up and were disciplined and were loving and believed in community and cared for one another. That's why New York has made the progress it's made in COVID. It's not over. There's more to do. We're still wary, but God bless New Yorkers, and God bless the state of New York, and thank you all for being here, and let's give a big round of applause to our great DEC Commissioner, Basil Segos. Thank you, Governor. Great to be back with you all. I want to make uh, some quick acknowledgments here. We have a fantastic group on the boat with us. Senator Todd Kaminsky. Uh, Senator John Brooks, Senator Jim Gorin, Senator Anna Kaplan, Senator Monica Martinez, Senator Kevin Thomas, and Assemblyman Steve Engelbright. Uh, we also have Kelly Cummings, a great director of state operations, Bill Olfelder from the Nature Conservancy, executive director, and uh, my first boss, Eric Goldstein from uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council. Also, the great Captain Tony Delernia. Everyone knows Tony. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's with us today. And from Wells Fargo, Karen Alinsky. Uh, again, Karen, thank you for everything that you've done for us as a state. Um, and the governor had mentioned uh, where we are with, with the environment. And I, I think we're at an inflection point, or we're beyond the inflection point. 
on the environment. Uh, you look at the skies above uh, above uh, upstate New York this morning, and they had a yellowish tint from the fires in in the West, and our country is literally burning uh, as a result of climate change. And as the governor noted, you have a federal government that either doesn't care or is intent on making it worse by making the mistakes of the past. And, uh, and here we are as a nation confronting multiple crises at the same time. And in my view, that is why we are fortunate to have, as the chief executive of this state, uh, Andrew Cuomo, who's been leading us through so many uh, crises over the years, uh, none more impactful than COVID, and certainly the world knows the governor from his work on, on COVID. I know the governor from eight years in the trenches with him on the environment. And I can say for certain that there is no governor anywhere in the nation that is as committed to addressing environmental problems and, and righting the wrongs of the past as Governor Andrew Cuomo. He's established a legacy that will be written about for years to come. And when uh, the chips fell at the federal level and the feds backed away from the environment, the governor already had six years of action uh, in the bank. Uh, that we could point to and use as a catalyst for some of the incredible work that's happened over the last few years. A nation's leading climate law, which we are implementing now, all the talk of climate, we are implementing here in New York. Uh, the, uh, the work on, on protecting uh, our, our drinking water supplies and the incredible amount of energy that's gone into uh, restoring uh, our, our water quality upstate that had long been taken for granted. Uh, protecting lands in the Adirondacks, in Long Island, uh, and everywhere in between. Uh, boosting recreation to the point where uh, we're seeing levels never before seen here in our state parks and, and the DEC facilities, which is a good thing. And it's because we've made investments in those spaces. And that's all because of the governor. And of course, a commitment to environmental justice, which is a, a centerpiece of everything that, that we've been doing at DEC for years. So on to reefs. Um, and the reason why we're here today, just a quick bit of history. The first reefing in New York took place back in 1949 um, at a, uh, a reef uh, just a couple of miles uh, to the south of, of Long Beach. Um, and that program uh, grew over time uh, for a couple of decades and then went dormant really for the better part of, of 30 years until 2018 when the governors said, hey, we have the, this bridge coming down in the middle of the Hudson River, what, what can we do to, uh, to make use of it, to, to restore uh, some of our, our, our habitat off the coast of the Atlantic, and what can we do to, to, uh, to make use of that material? And that's really what this is. I mean, this is about improving habitat. It's about uh, making use of, of, of perhaps derelict equipment and, and uh, construction material. Then it's about boosting the economy. And uh, if you know, uh, the economy here in Long Island is so powerfully focused on this beautiful ocean uh, with thousands and thousands of jobs and billions of dollars of economic activity. So, you know, bringing this material today, bringing the material that we brought to these reefs over the last two years, um, you know, we're taking effectively inanimate material, material that does not exist in a living form, dropping it into the water, and then it, it, it immediately becomes living material, just like a normal reef. Um, so the Hempstead Reef itself is three miles offshore. I'm going to put this uh, slide motion, slide in motion here. You can see where we are at the Hempstead Reef. Um, Hempstead Reef, right here. Uh, we have a number of other reefs, as Governor mentioned, 12 reefs in total. We'll be bringing more online in the coming years. Um, just a quick trivia question. Why do you think 12 Mile Reef is called 12 Mile Reef? It's 12 miles offshore. So some of these have intricate names. Some are very descriptive. Um, but we're focused on all of them. So this particular reef, we've gone obviously from sea level, uh, at ground level, uh, and we'll be going out three miles to a depth of about uh, 50 to 70 feet. It's a 744 acre reef that uh, has uh, effectively, it's a flat uh, area, but there is some undulation. Um, so the, the method of, of uh, deposition of these materials is to create a patchwork design. Uh, what we're envisioning today is almost a circle underground, maybe 300 feet, 300 yards uh, in, in, in width, 
uh, with a number of emplacements of these uh, rail cars um, to effectively cluster them horizontally and vertically. The more space you can create between each drop, uh, the more uh, chance there is for uh, life to find uh, habitat. And you do that in a way, uh, you're changing the structure of the floor of the, of the Atlantic in this area because it is largely flat. So if you want to uh, create uh, space where fish and habitat uh, can survive, then you need to uh, create those structures and you need to, need to create distance between them. So you have the rail cars, you have the Jane, which is a tug, and then you've got a turbine, which can, comes all the way to us from uh, the New York Power Authority in Niagara Falls. So nice trip there that that, that, that turbine has made. Um, so I mentioned some of that distancing. So what we're doing with this particular reef is a nice circular emplacement, and uh, that'll be distanced at least uh, a football field away from the next emplacement. Again, creating those uh, interstitial spaces. And, and really, it's amazing. As quick as we put the materials down in the, in the water, we begin to see life. We begin to see that life because it's a haven immediately for fish. Um, it begins to teem with life. And um, you'll see, uh, as, as early as later on this afternoon and tomorrow, uh, Tautog, Scup, Porgy, they're going to move in. They're going to take advantage of some of the, the sheltering, the ocean currents, and, uh, and, and some of that space provided by the reef structure. And then you see the colonizing organisms, opportunistic colonizing organisms. And those are the ones that really begin to create that structure, that permanent structure on the reef. You think about anemones and sponges and mussels. Uh, algaes, things like that. They begin to occupy the reef and they begin to create that food chain. And then uh, the, the shellfish come, lobsters, crabs, other crustaceans. Um, they begin to take, take hold and, and create that additional uh, hard bottom habitat. Uh, and finally, the larger marine species, dolphins, sharks, striped bass, uh, they begin to fit, uh, visit these reefs for feeding opportunities. And then the top predator, the people come to fish and, uh, and of course, diving, um, which has been a very popular uh, uh, economic activity for years in this area. And, uh, and now we can uh, anticipate certainly more traffic. So uh, this is very exciting for us. Uh, it's been an exciting uh, couple of years. There's a listing of all the materials that we've dropped so far. This will continue in earnest for the coming years. So again, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank the governor for his leadership on everything from COVID, keeping us all safe, uh, to his leadership on, on really driving uh, climate, climate action uh, worldwide. So thank you, governor. Thank you all. We're having some rough seas right now. Um, so what you're seeing on the right, you, you will be shortly, is a 250-foot barge that is holding 15 rail cars. They are 74 feet each. They are called center beam cars. They're all steel. They're used for transporting lumber mostly and other building materials. Um, because of the rough waves, this large crane um, uh, will be later, if uh, the swells uh, die down, will be attached to the rail car, the, the barge with all the rail cars, and it's going to drop those in the water. Um, also, to the left of us, Right now, you're looking at the Jane. That is a 70-foot tugboat, and she is sinking. So she was plugged with a bunch of holes, um, So and she was tugged out here. They plugged up the holes, and then they took out the plugs when we got out here. And Jane, right here, 1939 tug, she's retired, and uh, she is going down. So we're going to be seeing her go down. Um, and then, in a little while, we're going to go over here to a barge that's behind these two tugs. Um, that's a smaller barge. It holds a uh, wind turbine um, that is 120,000 uh, uh, pounds, um, and that is from a power plant out in Niagara Falls. So pretty soon, by tomorrow, we're going to have some encrusting organisms are going to be uh, attracted to Jane, and uh, a lot of the, the fish, like black sea bass and porgy, they're going to like find shelter in there from the larger fish. Um, that starts really right away. These, these reefs really you know, begin to team uh, with life right away. It's going to lift it up and put it in the water and reef it. And there goes Jane again. There she goes. There she goes.
Yeah, this is an expansion. I mean, this is an expansion of the original reef. Correct. There's another one that you can put it to, right? Yeah. 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 We're, we're, we're actually growing this from 744. We're growing it to 850. You want to watch? Really? Yeah. 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 744. How far along are you with the 744? I'll have to check where we are in the process. It's a, it's a permitting process, environmental review. We do it with the Army Corps of Engineers. Okay, we're going to circle this barge for a little while as they prepare to get this rail car uh, and put it in the water. So again, it's going to be lifted by, uh, we should go to the other side if we can. Right. The old the old rail car photos you've seen back in the day of the dropping of the red birds and aluminum cars. I mean, those cars just don't last down here. They get beaten around by the currents and uh, dissolved by the salts. And what you have here is a really thick gauge steel. Um, the governor said, this is going to be here be long after we are. Um, and you look at the, the, the thickness of the turbine right next to it. What's it, 30 by 13, uh, nearly solid. And that is uh, 120,000 pounds of steel. That'll be around for many, many years. And you might be wondering why the shape of this particular rail car. Uh, traditionally, these are for carrying lumber. So you see these all over the place, all over the country, and uh, occasionally they are uh, yep. no longer being used. Here we go. There it goes. It's 42,000 pounds. Just got to just added to Hempstead Reef.